Olivia? <laughs> hi, hi, how are you? Well, I can't see you. Hi. <laughs> there you are. Oh, in the darkness. You are um, in the shadows. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'll, I'll just introduce both of you. Um, so yeah, so uh, Juliet Bashar is a filmmaker known for her feature film, Kamikaze Hearts. Make sure my mic is on. And her documentary, the documentary work, The Battle of Tuten House, about the radical queer squat in Berlin. She has her own production company, uh, producing and directing projects for PBS, London's Channel 4, and Miramax, among others. Sharon Mitchell is a sexologist and former porn actor, director, and addiction counselor. After making Kamikaze Hearts, Sharon Mitchell continued in the adult entertainment industry until 1995. Um, she immediately kicked drugs and went on to higher education and got a bachelor's degree in psychology. She went on to get a master's degree in public health and eventually a PhD in human sexuality, spe specializing in HIV research. Uh, Dr. Mitchell opened the Adult Industry Medical Healthcare Foundation, an HIV testing and health center for the adult entertainment industry and local neighborhoods for over 13 years. Dr. Mitchell is retired now, but still volunteers teaching safe sex to local high, to, at the local high school and also volunteering at the county health department running groups on drugs and alcohol. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so we all just watched the film. Um, yeah, it was so great to see and like so wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, also, um, so I have a few questions, um, but we'll also be taking audience questions. So if anyone has anything, cool. yeah. Um, okay, cool, I guess I'll start. Um, so yeah, so Kamikaze Hearts was long and available and now has this beautiful 4K restoration. Um, I guess I'll start with, with Juliet. Um, what was it like to look back on this project? Yeah, um, I have to say it has been so surreal, this reissue of the film. It's been um, a very interesting experience because so much has changed in the world since this film came out. Um, the LGBTQ transformation, um, the people's attitudes towards por pornography is completely different. Uh, uh, social media, um, and the way people read uh, films that are part, oh, hang on, I'm having a little quote, here we go. The way people read films that are part fiction, part have this kind of hybrid quality is completely different. So um, it's interesting because this is the kind of context that uh, the film should have been seen to begin with. It had a really different reception initially, uh, so this is exciting and, and like I said, kind of surreal. Oh. Uh, and Sharon, how about you? What is it like looking back on the film? Uh, it's, well, uh, physically it's like looking at my granddaughter if I had one. <laughs> but, um, you know, looking back, I I'm just honored that it was recognized as the art film that it was because it never quite fit in any genre. It wasn't really a documentary because everything was scripted. And um, it was, but yet it was, um, it was kind of an eclipse of the time. Bless you, Jules. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm just honored to be a part of it. And I'm glad it's being, you know, just shown right now, especially when we're going through so much uh, stuff in the United States here, you know, as you've heard with uh, LG, BTQ rights and abortion rights and, and things like that. And, and for me, I, I think I made it very clear in that film that um, there, that time was, no one ever really identified as gay or bi or straight or this or that. I mean, we were all just fucking each other, you know, and having a great time. Some of us made a living at it and some of us didn't, but, um, I want us to get back there, <laughs> wherever that was. <laughs> right. um, Juliet, you mentioned um, the reception of the film. Can you talk a little bit about how it was received initially and kind of what it's like to see the reception change over the years? Oh boy, that's a big question. Um, initially, uh, the the film initially was misunder misunderstood in a, in a couple of major ways. Um, not misunderstood, but framed 
audiences watched it differently. Uh, the first thing is it was presented as a documentary, as a straight documentary. And I, as particularly in festivals, I think I, I, you know, I would, I would say, no, it's not a documentary. And they would say, yes, it really is a documentary. And I think part of the issue was they needed material for the documentary section oh. of the film festival. Um, but partly because they just couldn't see it as um, uh, for what it was. So, and, and for that reason, I think it was misread. I think you can't really understand what's going on in the film because the film, the form of the film reflects the theme of the film in that it's a little conundrum, what is real, what is not real. Um, uh, so that's number one. Number two, it was, uh, it was categorized as a lesbian film at the time, which in a way was great because that, uh, that create, that there was a huge audience for lesbian, you know, there were gay and lesbian film festivals. And, but the truth is just like Mitch just said, um, nobody, none of the three of us who I think all kind of, we all kind of came of age in the late 60s, had our first sexual experiences then during the sexual revolution. And we were all kind of thought of ourselves in a funny way as sexual revolutionaries and much more interested in transgression and rule breaking and kind of, uh, I remember Mitch's line was, I'm trisexual, I'll try anything. Um, <laughs> And uh, um, and that was even Tigger, who came out of the mainstream lesbian uh, community. She was having sex with men on camera. I mean, she no longer felt felt uh, comfortable in that world. So, um, but that was impossible, I would say, to explain at that time. It was unacceptable. Any women that had sex with men also um, were viewed with a kind of suspicion and mistrust and like you were betraying and sexuality. Yeah. That was a huge issue for Tigger. She was, I mean, she really struggled with that. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so I would say those are the two main, uh, two main differences. Mm -hmm. I don't even know, Mitch, I don't even know where you were when we released this. I don't probably either. <laughs> I mean, uh, I might have been in my, uh, in the spoon, so to speak. I, yeah, uh, in, the, in the spoon. I mean, I was, um, I was doing a lot of movies in Europe and, um, and I would do films for six months and then I would go on and do burlesque for six months. And so, I mean, God knows where I was. But I was making money regardless. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you kind of mentioned um, that this this film is kind of hard to categorize and kind of indefinable. Um, Juliet, did you always have this idea for the film to be experimental and kind of semi-documentary, but also fictional at the same time? Um, yes, I. the idea was to start it out feeling like a straight doc and then and to play with the assumptions that the audience at that time had which was if you're watching a documentary it's true so um and then I wanted to have it kind of disintegrate from there as we got more and more uh the opening was supposed to feel like our present the the presentation of the of the porn world as it sees itself, and then as it goes on, get more and more and more intimate. So I wanted this very polished feel to unfold into something grittier. That that was always part of it, and it was always part of it that it was going to be this documentary in the background, and in the foreground, uh, it would be the love story of Mitch and Tigger. And Charles Webb, who was the guy who's porn set we were going to use originally, um, basically pulled the plug on the project. He backed, out. He, he backed out. 
Yeah, but part of it was that he didn't like that. He says, it's, fish, it's neither fish nor fowl, Juliet. You know, it doesn't make sense. It's not fiction. It's not documentary. Audiences aren't going to understand this. And that's other than the fact that he didn't want a bunch of crazy doc people running under his feet while he was trying to make a film. But that was that really upset him. So, yes, yes, it always it always we always set out to do something experimental, um, but we didn't always set out to actually create a fake porn movie that was supposed to be a real doc. I mean, that was supposed to be a real porn film going on in the background. Right. Uh, and then Sharon, what was it like to sort of approach that as an actor, this sort of experimental, but also a doc? What was that process like? It was interesting um, uh, because part of me had to be kind of all those off camera stuff where I'm in drag, I look like Freddie Mercury with the hat on and everything. It's like, um, <laughs> you know, I had to be me, but then when those snippets of me playing in the character and there were Jerry's pulling my dress off and, and all that kind of stuff, um, it, everything was scripted, but I, I did not act um, other than portray Mitch, whatever I thought Mitch was at that time. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and then in the scenes where I was acting, I was acting in character. Um, but um, yeah, I was portraying my persona. Mm -hmm. That's the best way I can put it. Um, so yeah, Juliet, can you tell us a little bit about how this film came to be? Yeah, I was um, pretty much just got out of college and I was, uh, I had had an internship working with a doc filmmaker, uh, doing a film about the effects of television on the American public. And uh, I was in the middle of the recession. Ronald Reagan was president, as Mitch alludes to. Uh, there were no jobs. I was kind of scraping. <laughs> scraping a living, you know, trying to do punk music videos. And um, one day, one of the people from the TV documentary called me up and said, hey, do you want to work? You want to make $100 a day working on a feature film? And I thought, oh, my God, a feature film. I'm going to get a job on a movie. Wow, right. I'm so excited. And uh, I went down to the set and they told me, uh, here's a line and you can't go across that line. You know, you just do everything. I was the production assistant. I was delivering, you know, cheese puffs and M&Ms and things. Um, and uh, you can't go across that line. And I was really curious about what was going on on the other side of that line. Um, and over the course of the day, I kind of started to suspect that they were making pornography in there. And I was like, oh, oh. No. <laughs> And then uh, Annette Haven, it was an Annette Haven film. And um, at one point she burst out of the set and, uh, and what I saw, I will never forget this image. She burst out and instead of, you know, this poor exploited woman, you know, hobbling out. In fact, she like burst out. She was radiant wearing her little pink tracksuit and her matching tennis shoes. And that blew my mind. So I, uh, and the whole world was like this, uh, it was totally surreal. It was absurd in a lot of ways. It was completely unexpected. And uh, it was like a little mini Hollywood. There were, you know, there was a little mini Francis Coppola. There were yeah. uh, a mini star system. There was a mini Academy Awards. And so, I wanted to recreate my first experience for people with all these, with this, you know, kind of surrealistic uh, um, gobsmacking experience of what the world was. Uh, and then I met Tigger and Tigger had this fantasy of doing this film that was a great homage to Sharon Mitchell, her great love. If only Mitch had the opportunity to do the great, the ultimate love scene. Um, and so these two uh, ideas just naturally came together. Oh, that's so great. Um, Sharon, uh, 
was there anything that surprised you while you were filming, uh, working on this project or nothing. anything that is, no? Nothing surprises me. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, I just, and if it does, I go along with it because I'm always intrigued by surprise and I always was. Uh, so nothing surprised me. Uh, I didn't really know what the hell Jules and Tigger were trying to do, but um, my loyalty to Tig and eventually to Jules, you know, I just followed the lead and I just did what I did, which all I had to do was basically be me. That's um, true. I had never met Mitch before we started filming. I met her the day we started filming. Oh, wow. Yeah. So she was the obscure object of desire the whole time. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, I mean, I have to say uh, the idea of shooting dope on camera, I was like, all right, bring it on. Nobody's ever done that before. You know what? If I'm going to be the only one that will do that, God knows what the heck I'm going to say, but let's do it. Let's do it. Let's show what it's really like when you get that rush whatever, you know, and um, that intrigued me. And Tigger and I, you know, we, the truth is we were always arguing. We had, we were very close. We spent a lot of time together, but we argued a lot. So it, it was as true in that aspect as it could be, I think. Mm -hmm. Was that, were those scenes like difficult to film? Like they're kind of like very emotional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, they were, they actually were because um, I kept feeling compelled that Jules wanted me to get more intimate and, 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 and I just, I just couldn't, I just couldn't bring her what she wanted. So all I could bring her was the truth. So um, that's what I did. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. It sure makes sense to Jules. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess I can reach out to the audience. Are there any audience questions about the work? I hope so. Yeah. Oh, wait, so I noticed, because you sent ahead a, a question I did, yeah. um, that I thought was really interesting that I hadn't thought about before. Could I? about what surprised me the most? Or was that the one you just asked? Oh yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. Was there anything that surprised you while you were filming? I, I was so, I thought about that. And for the first time I realized that the thing that surprised me the most was I was completely unprepared for the attitudes and the assumptions of um, these sort of straight, older male filmmakers. And they're, uh, I constantly had to convince them, well, they actually, they were very resistant to the idea that um, if, if they didn't understand something, it was because I was wrong. It was not because maybe there could be another way of doing things. For example, the cinematographer, um, yeah. well, he quit because yeah, he didn't he did. feel that I was, being didactic enough about uh, the exploitation of women. He walked off, we were, we were really, uh, <laughs> we were screwed. Um, Charles Webb, uh, like I talked about, he neither fish nor fowl, he couldn't understand it. He kind of turned around, he's in the film. He's the guy that comes in and pitches the, uh, he was not just, uh, the Marxist pornographer. He was also um, ran the Market Street Cinema, which was a um, where we shoot the stripping uh, strip shows scenes. Um, and the editor, the editor was, and I, I made some strange decision. I mean, I, I, did, I didn't disclose the degree to which the film was not a documentary to everybody. A lot of people on the set didn't realize it wasn't a real porn, porn film. Um, I, I had- That was tricky. It, that was really tricky. I don't know how you did that, Jules. I got it. You me. understand why it had to be. I mean- these, oh, I do, of course. Um, and uh, and uh, the editor was, um, 
I didn't I didn't disclose to the editor that all of the the everything had been storyboarded and uh, at the end he was literally on his way to take the film in to put the titles on and he said uh, you know I really you can't pay me you're out of money so I really want a co-director credit because I really created this film and I said well wait what he goes yeah the way it's all you know I I that's really where a documentary is made is in the editing room and I'm responsible for everything and I said well no you're not and he said yes I am and I said no you're not and I went to my pile of papers and I pulled out the storyboards and short showed him you know how it had been cut was how it was always intended yeah. and um, I had to present him with proof that it wasn't his idea anyway I just wanted to comment on that then you'll notice that I, I only noticed this for the first time he gave himself the very first credit of the film yeah. instead of Karen yeah. Mitchell the first credit that comes on is editor I mean <laughs> that's the male ego that I was dealing with at the time anyway I, Rude. <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess, uh, any audience questions or any comments or anything? Yes, in the back. Sure. Um, what were the inspirations for the film at the time? Um, oh, you mean like cinematic references, that sort of thing, or? Yeah, yes. Well, that's a really good question. Um, I was really interested in uh, the work of, uh, uh, Herzog and Robert Frank, Cocksucker Blues. Yeah. Um, I was really interested in the work of the Maisel brothers, yeah. um, Grey Gardens, the original Grey Gardens, um, uh, and Reds. I was really interested in Reds. The Reds had come out in 1981. And so that was a fiction film with interviews stuck in in this kind of Brechtian way, sort of breaking the fourth wall. And that's where the idea from the, the opening, those, those interviews, that's where that came from. Um, and I had, uh, oh, it's, I might have the book right here. No, I don't have it. I don't hard. Um, uh, this uh, semi-text book called Polysexuality had just come out. And that was a huge inspiration, this completely kind of transgressive way of looking at the world. That was an inspiration. Um, Sharon, were there any sort of like, do you have any like other like film influences or actresses that you were sort of looking towards during this film? Oh, well, you know, um, I mean, I couldn't help when I was walking down those stairs, but channeling, you know, uh, Gloria Swanson, because as I said, I've always loved her because she kind of transcended so many uh, myriads of, of types of film from silent to talkies to, to this to that and a lot of drugs. And, um, and yeah, I channeled her, of course, I channeled her and, you know, I named myself after Martha Mitchell and I've just been watching this, uh, TV show on Martha Mitchell lately. And um, I've always channeled, I've always channeled women with kind of a big mouth and um, a big ego and big talent. I just want to say also, since she mentions um, Gloria Swanson, that the opening with the opera, that's very much a Gloria Swanson shot. Um, so, uh, and that shot of her by the pool with the sunglasses on. Um, I was trying to reference uh, old films, which yeah. is because I wanted to quote the way that I thought or Tigger had told me that Mitch perceived herself. So I was trying to do that cinematically. That was one of my big ideas at the time is I wanted to enter into the world of the subject of the films generally, not just this one, and create the world that they are living in cinematically. So that was really interesting because Mitch is an actress so yeah it's such a beautiful shot as well it looks yeah it looks beautiful it is a great shot probably the best shots I've ever seen of myself <laughs> or my granddaughter or whatever oh, yeah. <laughs> um yeah are there any other uh audience questions anyone else any comments yes yeah I'm curious about the choice of using Carmen oh yeah that's a great question 
Um, they just asked um, the what was the intention behind um, using Carmen and then combining it with uh, with the rest of the story. So at the time, uh, this, the golden age of porn, um, they were doing all these parodies. Uh, I met, I think I, there was a MASH parody. There was a Scheherazade parody. You know what I'm talking about, Mitch. Remember all those yes, parodies? and let's not forget Captain Lust and the Private Women, which was like. <laughs> yeah, and I think, yeah. And I think we might have all met on, no. Anyway, we won't get into all the parodies, but I had this idea that it was kind of absurd and yet at the same time plausible that someone would be shooting a porno opera. And, um, and, it, and of course there was no internet then. At the time we did this, there'd be no way that anybody could Google and find out that there was no porno opera. It would have just been. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so Carmen, uh, of course, because the Carmen character kind of reflected the Sharon Mitchell character, this object of desire. So part absurd, part, you know, thematic. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, anyone else? Yes. It looked like there might be a concern behind uh, filming of the fight scene. Oh yeah, uh, was there any story behind the filming of the fight scene between Tigger and the woman at the burlesque show? So, um, the way I can't, you know, Tigger and I, in the time that's passed, we've talked about various scenes in the film, and um, neither one of us can complete what the way I approached most scenes was to tell some people some stuff was going on, and other people other stuff was going on, and try and introduce elements that would be volatile or kind of predicted to have certain effects, but then just to let go and let the crew document what happened. Um, I was always a troublemaker, so I kind of continued on my troublemaker path. And I think I told Mitch, I think I told Tigger to go to the stage and try and get Mitch's attention, try and get her off the stage and try and bring her back so we could ostensibly shoot. Um, and then there was that bouncer uh, I might have said something to her about maybe uh, if Tigger goes up to the stage, don't I, I just can't remember if I said anything to the bouncer. I might I I knew that Tigger wasn't allowed to approach the stage, so I was probably trying to provoke something. But I was not trying to provoke this, you know, cat fight that happened. Wow, that was a total surprise, and they were serious. Yeah, they were. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Although I just want to say, I think the presence of a camera inspires people to go beyond. <laughs> we normally do, yeah. I, I tried to use the camera as another subject, as another kind of character in the film, so that when I wanted people to be really on, that's when we shot the scenes with the big lights and the big camera and the big crew. And when we wanted a more intimate feel, that's when we stripped down into the total skeleton crew uh, at the end. So yeah, the, 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 the camera itself is a provocateur for sure. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> yeah, I think that's all the questions we have and I'm, I don't have any more questions. So yeah, thank you so much for both of your time and thank you so much for the film. It was, it's, really, it's really wonderful and it's great to see in a theater. Thank, Thank you, Ms. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, great questions. Oh, thanks so much. Oh, yeah, yeah Juliet is calling in from Greece and it's 4.30 a.m. So thank you so much. <laughs> I'll be back in California tomorrow. Wet dreams, Bye. everybody. Good night. Thank you. Bye, Mitch. Bye, Jules. She's back there. Kalinita, Kalimera. Kalinita, Kalimera. Okay. Bye. Bye, all. Thank Bye. you.